Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Sean Haggett. This edition of Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Axon would also like to give all the loyal listeners of the Moving Iron Podcast a free pair of deerskin work gloves. And they'd also like to give you $50 off the registration for the 2023 Moving Iron Summit coming up here in Nashville, Tennessee, September 11th through the 13th. Um, if you would like to get the deerskin gloves, send an email to marketing at axontire.com and send me an email at marketing and not marketing. I don't have a marketing department. I don't have one of those. You can just send me. You know, it's, your, it's your wife. She's well, yeah, wife. that's true. That's true. That, that's my wife. That's her. She is the uh, creative half of the moving. Iron podcast. Uh, send that email to moving iron podcast, moving iron podcast.com. And I'll make sure to get back to you, uh, with that registration deduction there all right valley transportation has been hauling ag construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years call parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs at valley transportation our goal is to help you reach yours no matter how you buy your ag equipment whether it's from a dealer an auction or private party ag direct can help you finance it you can even apply online at agdirect.com learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com Tractor Zoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. Tractor Zoom's Iron Comps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. This podcast is also brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. The Dealer Connect CRMI app with the integrated inventory management is an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create connected customer experience and transform how you work today. All right, Sean. Sean is with uh, Hack Up Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida. And down there dodging hurricanes left and right and getting a bunch of rain. So how are you doing this morning, Sean? Well, uh, the, the, uh, the, the last plank to the Noah's Ark that I built yesterday is, is complete. So now we, I'm going to be able to get around bulk we for a little while. That's good. That's real good. I was getting, I was worried about that. If you're going to, if you're going to make it out of there or not. So how, how was, how was the uh, impact of, of hurricane Nicole? Well, it was a borderline one at the very last second, and mm. it, it really wasn't a hurricane. It was more of a strong tropical storm. Um, so for the most part, 10, 15 inches of rain, which is not unusual for Southeast Florida. We get that all thing all the time. And, you know, for the most part, you know, winds maybe 30 to 50, which we get that all the time down here. I mean, overall, not really a major impact. I mean, there's always some people in the wrong areas that are in flood zones or something, or if you happen to be right in the direct fire when it was a category one, maybe you had some issues, but for the most part, shoot for Southeast Florida, we, we would take this storm every single year and be, and thank the, the almighty ground of God that we're on. Um, really uh, yeah. not for us. We'll, we're, we're very, very happy to have a storm of this, uh, of this kind. Yeah. yeah. So in, in Nebraska, 30 to 50 mile an hour winds, that's a breeze. So yeah. We're, we're doing all right doing all well, right well i could say is you know i i, I think we might have had six or seven inches of rain of between here right here between let's say um uh, six o'clock last night to this morning and there's not a puddle out there because that's just the way we're you know we we have the system here we have the soils we have the canals and we just we're just able to handle tremendous amounts of rain at least in southeast florida without any issue so right for us not a problem yeah. So. Okay. Well, good to hear, man. I was thinking about you last night when I was watching the news. So, <clears throat> um, cause my, my geography of, of Southeast Florida is spot on. So I was, <laughs> you know, I was, didn't know where you're at. So I was, I mean, I know everything else is around me. So the, the big, the big, the big unbelievable event is that Miami for the very, very first time in its history voted for a Republican. Look out, red wave. So Miami-Dade County voted for DeSantis. It's the first time they've ever, in any race of any kind, have ever voted for someone other than a Democrat. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, just an interesting to see that happen. You know, maybe there's so many people moving from out of town into Miami, and they are, by the way, that it looks maybe the demographics are changing there to where you're having enough people coming into Miami that are from red states that maybe maybe Miami is going to shift its uh, historical 
uh, voting pattern. Too early to say, you know, DeSantis was, was extremely popular, um, but you know, we'll, we'll find out in future elections whether this was a trend change or just DeSantis being just a, you know, an unusual candidate. So, yeah. Something to say about a guy that, that bucks the system and decides that we're going to open up our economy and not make sure not make sure he won, he, he won by 20 percent the largest mm -hmm. vic, uh, margin of victory by a long shot ever seen in the history of florida politics so pretty remarkable yeah you know yeah they had uh there's a lot of red in in this in florida you know on, on when they were doing those breakdowns of the voting maps and everything it was pretty impressive. well i mean we, we've been guy. we've been we've been kind of borderline red for a long time like right on the edge but just a little bit but now we get so many people coming into florida e either from blue states or from red people in blue states or from reds you know we're just getting a lot more red coming in and i think florida's getting like it seems to me that we're moving towards it being from marginally red to like mm -hmm. very strongly red and it makes sense you know the people that would move down here are the people that like the policies of DeSantis, and that would be those that are more favorable to, you know, red red state kind of thinking. Yeah. So uh, it would make sense that we might be shifting our voter profile a little bit, and um, and at the same time, in the blue states, if you lose those red people, it makes those states even more staunchly mm -hmm. uh, democratic strongholds. So it, yeah. it kind of go, it kind of works both ways, right? I mean, yep. the Absolutely. blue gets stronger, the red gets stronger. So and we kind of you know that everyone thought this red wave was coming. I didn't think so. I, I said to everyone that asked me, I said, I thought maybe Republicans would marginally win the House and marginally lose the Senate. I don't know how it's going to turn out exactly yet on the Senate. We still, looks like the Republicans could, might still win if Herschel Walker wins the runoff, but who knows? But bottom line is, uh, you know, the red wave, you know, really didn't come. And, and I think it has something to do with this migration issue where the blue states and, and some of those marginal blue states that lost red voters you know they did they, they went blue right. and i think there was a misunderstanding of this migration pattern and uh and that uh, you know we just the, the 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 movement towards or this thought process of a red wave you know they just they, they i think they missed how that's all playing out and, and what it still sets i mean if you look at the pretty much you look at it we're a country equally divided pretty much yeah. i mean you you really can't get a congress any more down the center I mean, it looks like, you know, it, you know, I mean, both both the House and, and um, the Senate are, are about as straight down the middle as you can possibly get. Right. So really not much has changed. We have half the country that wants a certain way of um, government policy. We have their half that wants another one. And it's pretty hard to move forward as a country when when you have two very strongly different concepts of what needs to be done. I'm not sure how it all gets resolved, but that's not usually a healthy sign. Mm -hmm. for a country to be that equally divided but there yep. we are there you have it so yeah that's uh definitely a different time than than what i've been a part of since i've been in the united states of america so it's been a uh you know typically you'd have a, you know if it was one side or the other and, and strongly democratic stomach republican there was always a, a sense that things were going to happen and get done but even even it's even you go down and start splitting through um the Democratic Party and the, the differences they have within their own party and the same on the Republican side. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we, it's huge it's divisions within the party. Oh, yeah. yeah. Huge divisions. Within the party. So it's even oh. hard to get everybody on the same team on the same side. You know what I mean? So it's 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 a whole it's a whole thing, Sean. Well, and the problem I also have is, is you know, Republican presidents uh, and Democratic presidents really haven't had a mandate for a long time. Right. Meaning they really have. And but yet they rule like they have a mandate and they and they force the extreme right or the extreme left onto the scene when there's no mandate. You know, the country didn't say they wanted you to go, you know, go to the extreme right or left. They said we we really don't we're really centrist. Right. We don't really want much more than just more centrist policies. Yet, you know, every president, red and blue, mm -hmm. both try to put these extreme, you know, impose extreme policies on a country that's equally divided where there's no mandate. And that's really not the way it should be and that's i think that's where all this anger is coming from on both sides yeah um and why there's you know uh, riots and there's there's just increased violence because i just think you know both sides have felt abused by the other side when there's really no mandate right yeah the blue will say well yes we have a mandate well no 
half of you feel a certain way and the other half, there's no mandate. I'm sorry. You right. may disagree with the other half, but as a country, we are no, there is no mandate. Right. Um, so at some point, <laughs> the country yep. has to decide, hopefully that, you know, we're going to decide what, you know, that we're on the same page or, or I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it's, that's a, it's a weird time for sure. It's a very weird time. It's a very, very weird time. And I, I, if, if anyone studies the history of governments of countries throughout hundreds and thousands of years, um, uh, these kinds of, of moments of extreme division are a dangerous time for any country. I just hope we are able to find some common ground. You know, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're all Americans and, uh, you know, I, uh, understand that I have certain views that are different from others. And I don't promise that I, I healthy I, discourse, I, right? Yeah. Healthy discourse. I have no problem with a healthy discourse. I mean, my business, my goodness, half the people think I'm an idiot for saying things that I say about agricultural prices. They think I'm totally wrong. That's fine. It doesn't mean I don't think they're good analysts. It doesn't mean I don't think they're good people. It doesn't mean I think they're wrong. I, I may think they're wrong, but it doesn't mean that, you know, I have a problem with that. That's the way the market's supposed to work. I have a problem with not having that discourse, right? You know, not being able to actually hear both sides of the argument and, and make a conclusion where the other side is just basically, argue, you know, not allowing you or not allowing that discussion to happen because, you know, they know best. That's where I come in and say, you know, that's a problem for me. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Yep. No, there's, there's a, and all that stuff is it's getting harder and harder to do sean yeah getting harder to do all yeah. right so yesterday we had a big november report come out brazil is gonna have you know they're gonna feed the world three times over it sounds like and uh they've got they're somewhere they're they're estimating a 153.5 million metric tons of soybeans this year and 1.2 million metric tons um that's from the prior forecast so it's up quite a bit from that um corn is i mean their corn crop looks great i mean everything <laughs> about is look, looking good um you look at our corn crop here so usd expected it's to be lower in the estimate of the u.s production of 13.887 billion bushels from 13.895 billion bushels raised uh based on rotor survey analysis. so corn stocks uh ending for 2023 revised about 35 million bushels to 1.2 uh, million bushels. So um saw some pressure come from that yeah, yesterday, Sean. So I guess your reaction to what you saw happen in the uh, report yesterday. No, I think the government said anything really outlandishly different, Casey. They said, you know, or we got, we pretty much got the corn yield right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you never know what they, when it actually is. Nobody does, right? right. We, we pretty much got the, the U.S. soybean yield right. Um, they said so far, the weather in, in Brazil looks fantastic. So no reason not to say big crop potential on the right. Mm -hmm. Um, some question marks in, um, in uh, Argentina, although it looks like some, for, for the first time this growing season, some beneficial rains coming this week, but too early, too early to make a conclusion. I mean, I really don't think they gave the market anything new or different, but, but, you know, more, bullish markets need new news new pounds of flesh to go higher yes. each and every week and if you just give them what they already know they sell on boredom or lack of another reason to buy so i think the grain markets are, are just suffering from you know they don't have anything new we know soybean supplies are tight we know corn supplies are tight we know we've had a dry start to the winter wheat crop planting in the u.s although some rains are coming in but they need something new and they're not getting it. So, and, and we're, and we remain in a bearish environment for overall commodities that says to me on the margin, we're going to get some pressure. The, the only way you're going to really get the market to move higher appreciably from here, in my opinion, is you need to get um, weather really involved and, and you really can't get excited about weather until December. You know, it's kind of like, are you really, really going to worry about weather in May in the U S no, you're really going to worry about it maybe late June. You're going to start going, huh, you know, mm -hmm. things are looking a little rough. Um, so we're not just, we're just not quite there yet on the weather in South America. Although, although unbelievable start to Brazil. Um, 
and or, and or you need some geopolitical thing to fire up uh, beyond what we have been trading for a long time. Meaning we're we've traded the so until we get one of those things, or we need to have some dramatic change in monetary policy. Casey, you know the Fed says we're ready to pivot. We're going to lower rates. We're going to print a ton of money. You know something. something and, yeah. You know, and even though you know the CPI, the markets are all excited today. You know about the CPI being full expectations. The Fed's not going to be uh, lowering rates or printing money anytime soon. Um, and so there's a limit to how much you can get that part of it going. You know. Right. So I think we're just kind of stuck uh, here in the month of November with markets searching for news, can't finding it, and uh, and probably going to be in aggregate, you know, just just se selling the grains here on boredom for no other reason, just because you know people who are who own commodities have a very short time span. You yeah. know, they want they want instant gratification all the time. That's just the nature of commodity trading. And if they don't get it, they move on to something that's moving. And right. that's the way it, that's the way it works. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. So you got some news coming out of India right now. So they're having record wheat prices right now. I mean, their price of wheat is soaring inside their country. They're looking at all kinds of different ways to ease that that measure. Um, you know, India could consider doing some offloading of state stocks into the market and kind of flood their own market a little bit to kind of tame that price a little bit. Sean, as you look at, you know, because we've talked about this before, India is kind of that the glue that's been holding the world together from a, from a grains perspective, whether it's rice or whether it's wheat or whatever it is. And, and they're kind of hedging that, that, that pendulum right now. And you look at that. So that news coming out of, of India right now, Sean, what's your reaction to that? And how do you think that's going to affect your overall world market? <clears throat> the La Nina weather pattern. Now remember, we always say that grand solar cycle minimum patterns accentuate El Nino, they accentuate La Nina. Well, La Nina means uh, for Asia, good rainfall and, and you know excessive rainfall at times but overall uh good rainfall so so we have seen just big production out of india prior to this past year and they've been feeding the world meaning they're the ones that have been increasing the rice exports they're the ones that have been increasing the wheat exports you know they've really been one of the few places in the world that's been able to grow food like crazy where everyone else is struggling Mm -hmm. They just, they just seem to be in a sweet spot between missing the droughts and missing the excessive flooding. And they've been able to grow just tremendous amounts of food prior to this past season. But then this past season, um, the weather turned out less desirable. Meaning we had, we did have excessive flooding. We did have um, some untimely dryness, some excessive heat at the wrong times, you know, just a, a confluence of events and it has caused them to have, they're forced poor wheat and rice crop in a very long time. And, you know, when you have a country that's been exporting as aggressively as they have, they've been depleting their, their buffer reserves. And once they, you know, and when you do that and you start to see, oh my gosh, production is down, you quickly say, we have to worry about number one, which is ourselves and our 1.3 billion people that we need to feed. And so they have decided to put the kibosh on exports or export tax, you know, doing everything they can to limit now how much they sell um, until they can have a better idea of how next year's crop production is looking. Because, you know, what often happens, things that usually happen in, in clusters. You have one bad year follows another bad year. And, and if El Nino is coming 2023, they're going to have poor weather again. So this is a big change, especially for rice. It's a very, very big change. And um, I think that, um, you know, if you look at a lot of the, 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 the one market that has not really participated in the same fashion as corn and soybeans and wheat have to the upside has been the rice market. And I think that the rice market, you know, may, may, be, um, may be late to the party, but it may, may be one to watch um, as we move into 2023. Um, because I, I, I feel that, you know, what happened in China, which we weren't able to find a similar drought of a similar extremity in southern China, you know, we, we went back a thousand years, couldn't find it, anything quite like it. I, I just think there's that Asian rice prices and Asian rice supplies are going to be deficient for the first time since 08. And there's no way that we, in my opinion, that we've priced, you know, the global rice price appropriately to, to, to reflect that. So the wheat rice complex is an interesting complex. And um, 
um, you know, I would certainly be, be paying uh, you know, really close attention to that in 23. Right on. All right, so you had the CPI report came out this morning. Uh, Rich Potson is going to be on uh, later this week, and we're going to he's going to do a deep dive in, into his his studies from the economics that he that he follows and those kind of things. But we saw a uh, a little bit of a fall uh, from that. It was eight point two percent last month, and now it's like seven point seven or seven point nine. I don't remember the exact number, but it was down a little bit. So it's in all kinds of uh, uh, you know. I don't know bullish is the right word, but positive signs into the economy that some of this inflationary aspects that we're seeing right now are, are going to uh, start are, are easing anyway. Now, all that being said, Chairman Powell has made it very clear that they are they're going to continue to raise rates through the through next month, um, and then they're going to pause possibly. But he never said anything about lowering the rate. Like he made it pretty clear that we're going to stay at this extended high interest rate that we're at right now for an extended amount of time and not necessarily um, just because we stopped raising rates doesn't mean we're going to go backwards. Right. So thoughts there, Sean, I mean, you just kind of the same, the same point you made earlier about, you know, you got to feed the bull, you got to feed the bull, feed the bull, feed the bull. Well, he, he's you made know. it very, very clear. Um, you know, that, he, he, you know, that they have a target of two to 3% annual inflation to start backing off, you know, there's one thing to pause. Right. Well, pausing after an historic rise in interest rates isn't necessarily bullish. All the bearish implications to the economy continue. Right. All the bearish implications to demand continue. It just means they may not raise that much more. Now, now, now that is that is definitely less bearish, right? I mean, if this if 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 they're getting comfortable that the rate's coming down and and they're going to uh, start to slow down rate increases or pause, that is supportive, but it doesn't mean bull market. It just means that maybe the downside uh, potential is starting to um, be become a little reduced based upon that concept. So there's a difference between, you know, maybe the downside of the bear market is slowing down because of it to, you know, we're ready for, you know, a big bull market and asset prices again. Um, those are two different things. I, you know, and, and, and so then the question becomes, how quickly will this, will this inflation continue to fall? Will it accelerate to the downside? Will it stay steady? When will we get to two to three percent interest rates? If we do, will the Fed want to make sure we're there? Like, will they want to see it there for many months before they take action to lower rates? Um, so that's going to be all these questions and marks. But remember, Casey, we had a brutal sell-off, brutal sell-off uh, into September, early October, a historical time that we usually always have big breaks during that time for some reason. But we we almost always have what they call you know, holiday Christmas rally, you know, you rally from somewhere around Thanksgiving to somewhere around Christmas. It's, it's a usual time that the market just seasonally, you know, likes to rally if it has a reason to do so. So it looks to me like probably this news is enough to create uh, a relief rally, maybe some uh, bear market bounce, some momentum to the upside for a while. But in order to really, really change the tone of the market, you know, we're going to have to really see that inflation rate getting close to that two to three percent level, and it just looks to me like, you know, we're not going to get there, you know, um, for a while. And I think that you know we're going to have this enthusiasm will burn itself out as we approach the end of the year, and then we're going to still have to realize that the economy is slowing down, demand is still rough, and yeah. and, and, and maybe some things are going to happen that we still don't know yet. That could be some shocks to the economy that are a consequence of these higher rates. I mean, we saw that the blowing up of FTX, which was a big mm -hmm. Bitcoin trader. Um, the guy that ran the FTX was worth at one point, I think $38 billion. He had, it's now has no value. He's, he's zeroed out mm -hmm. in literally a couple of months because he played games with leverage and funny money and, and not doing his fiduciary responsibility. That's a consequence of pulling liquidity of, of increasing interest rates. How many people had their money in FTX? How many people lost money in FTX? Remember the whole value of FTX, you know, you know, 30, 40 billion was wiped out. So there's a lot of, uh, as, as, as Warren Buffett always said, you know, when the tide goes out, you, you find out who was swimming naked. Um, yeah, that's a good one. And, and yeah. so it, we just found one. Yeah. This, I forget his name. Clearly. This, this guy from FTX was very naked. And, and yeah. there's others, there's others out there, Casey. And so yeah. you have to be very careful 
you know, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, about these um, quick judgments the market makes and these big moves and thinking it's all over. Um, definitely encouraging to see inflation come up. We've already, but we already kind of knew this. Commodities lead inflation down. I mean, the commodities go down first and the inflation follows. This has always been the case throughout history. The commodities topped out, Casey, in the spring. Mm-hmm. And there's usually about a six month lag. You run the numbers. Yeah, inflation is coming down though because commodities have already shown that you know oil is down from 125 to 85, and you know you could do you know core, uh, wheat for, was 14, now it's eight and a quarter. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, we've had some big declines, and you know natural gas was 10, now it's five and three quarters. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, inflation is going to keep coming down because commodities already told you it's going to come down. It's not the only thing. That inflation is based upon what is it? It's a leading indicator of when inflation expectations can come down. So overall, I don't know what Rich is going to say, but I know Rich has been, I believe, pretty strong that he felt um, inflation was peaking. Um, mm-hmm. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I believe he's been on the, on the, on the records to say he thought inflation would peak, and I know that he's on the he's in the in the camp that his work says I believe, you know, that he doesn't see inflation being that much of a problem going forward as much as it has been um yeah and that's uh, that's kind of where he's been at on that he's he's been uh pretty much on the november december time frame is where you're going to see peak inflation and then you know easing easing of inflation well easing of 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 uh of the fed raising rates and stuff like that into into january the first quarter anyway of the year now eventually this leads to the dollar being you know rolling over and, and moving down protractedly which we think is a back half of 2023 event that would bring at least commodity inflation. We have to distinct this just we have to dis- distinguish between commodity inflation and like wage inflation or health insurance inflation or tuition inflation. There's a lot of inflation out there, but you know, what I'm talking about commodity inflation, I think that we could get some commodity inflation back in the back half of 23 when the dollar rolls over as a consequence of the Fed ultimately lowering rates and, and printing some more money again. Um, so, so that's where I think we're at and I, you know, be interesting to see what actually, you know, Rich has to say today and, and, you know, button up his, his, his view on, on, on those kind of things. So yeah. Sam Bankman fried. That's yeah. 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 Well, he, uh, 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 um, uh, 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 bit finance or I buy finance or whatever the name of the company he had called to say, you know, could you help us out? Buy, take us over. I mean, we're in trouble. And and they walked away from the deal yesterday, saying that their troubles are so vast that this, it's not savable. So uh, by uh, bit finance, I think it is, or by finance uh, walked away, said we're not we're, we're not interested. And so it, it, FTX is, um, it, you know, it's it's terminal. It looks to me. Imagine that start out the year and you may have thirty eight billion dollars, and then you're like, eh, maybe we should maybe we should not. Right. Yeah, they go through this. I mean, my goodness. Burns but, but you know, like, but, but what it is, what it is a symptom of is when you print too much money. Yeah. And the government spends too much money and you put too much stimulus in mm-hmm. and you keep rates low for too long. People take ridiculous risks with leverage. This happens over. I mean, this is nothing new, Casey. This has happened before. I mean, look yep. at the 08, 09 financial crisis, the ridiculous risks that were taken with leverage in the housing market by by these you know loans and liar loans and all i mean we do this over and over again but it's a consequence of poor monetary policy that leads to very that 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 instigates and promotes very very poor risk management strategies to the to the point where somebody that was worth 40 billion could be worth zero today 40 Um, billion dollars man yeah so so just you know that that to me says you know I would hope one day we, we could maybe have a, a, a different policy, a different way of managing monetary policy, managing the economy, managing its rates to where you know, we create more moderation instead of this boom bust cycle that we constantly seem to be going through. We print too much, we don't print enough, and we constantly have winners and, and losers and, and, and financial shocks. And, and just it just seems to me like we, we're creating messes we don't need to, but yep. I'm, not the one in, I'm, not the, <laughs> I'm not the one in control here, unfortunately. So. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. All right, let's talk a little bit about energy real quick, and we'll we'll uh, hang her up for the day. Looking at uh, looking at oil right now, oil prices are are still you know you got Brent crude just over ninety bucks at ninety two seventy eight, and you got 
West Texas at about 86, 12. And you're looking at what's going on there. We've seen some, they've seen some, some good, in, some good uh, increases this whole week across there with the news coming out of China and everything else about the COVID uh, COVID lockdown restrictions, easing and all those kind of things. So I guess looking at oil, what, what are your thoughts there? And I mean, I, I mean, I guess, how do you, how do you think that's going to play out right now? Cause again, I think it goes back to what you're saying that sooner or later, even though you're, the whole the rate i mean this is all kind of going around the cpi thing and all that stuff i mean i get all that but sooner or later you're going to see a a, st- a stopping point where they're just going to start selling stuff and prices are going to come back down you'd think i mean the, the game in, in crude oil is essentially that the government has decided to as we as you know dump spr and other governments to depress the price to help get inflation down and help people out um i do and they were doing this at a time that the Fed was being as aggressive in interest rates as, as we've seen since Paul Volcker. Right. I think their gamble is this. I think the gamble is that the economy is going to get so bad in the first half of 23 that they're going to be able to buy back the SPR at a cheaper rate that they've been selling the SPR. I mean, I, I, I don't know that I'm not, this is my speculation completely, but yeah. I've, I, if I'm in the round tables in the government, you know, the people that try to decide these kind of things and who's determining this strategy, I think that, you know, and, and even though, you know, uh, China claimed that, that the COVID lockdowns, now they locked down a whole bunch more overnight or yesterday, you know, so yeah, that's so, a, yeah. yeah so, 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 who knows? so, so I think the government is betting that what the Fed has done and the stance the Fed's going to continue to take with keeping rates high is going to bring demand down sufficiently that the government wants to be a buyer when the market really gets hit so that they prevent oil prices from going down to 35 again or you know damaging you know going down so low that it damages the long-term picture of 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 things so i think that's the gamble i think they're saying we decided to sell a bunch of our spr at arguably very high prices and we think we're going to be able to buy it back I, what, they, what target they put out there, Casey? What, 75? I think they said it's, they'd be interested right in buying it back. I thought it was 70, is what I thought. 70, 75, 70. So now, are they going to be right with the gamble? I mean, I don't know. But that's the gamble they made. If they're wrong with that gamble, meaning if they stop selling SPR and the price uh, isn't down that low and they're not able to buy the SPR back, you know, then we have a really ugly situation on our hands. You know? I think they're going to bring Sam uh, Bankman in to to do all that for them. So it's, got, a re- so it's a really dangerous game of when does yeah. the SPR dumping end? And when it does, uh, is the market sufficiently weak that will allow the government to buy those SPRs back? Um, I'm not smart enough to know. You know, I, I don't spend my every waking moment, an hour and minute and second analyzing the crude oil market. I do agriculture, but um, it's a huge gamble. And how that gets resolved is, is going to be paramount to whether you know, we get a big spike in crude oil or not. My guess is they're not going to be able to pull it off. Um, I think they're overestimating their ability to maneuver and that we might find ourselves in this. And, I, and, you know, Saudi Arabia and Russia know what we're trying to do. And they may try to pull some geopolitical um, dominoes to force our hand to where we don't, that, we, that the price starts to go up and, we, and we're out of SPR. And then what? So that's that's the game's being played. However, it gets resolved, Casey. It's it's the next three months, maybe six months at the max that we're going to find out is the government right or, or did they make a huge blunder here? Yeah. So. Well, you know, you know, it's pretty safe to say it's the latter when you're talking about the government, but it's usually, usually they're not. They don't tend to safe. be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <Safe laughs> usually, that's the case. Deep down, I hope I hope they pull it off because I don't want to so see too, the, 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 a big deal. Yeah. The consequence of being wrong is something really, really ugly. Yeah. Uh, to the upside in, in energy and really, really ugly to the downside in the economy. So. Yep. Yeah, it's a crazy amount of pressure right now on everything yeah. we do. So, all right, good stuff, Sean. Folks want to reach out to you, get more information about what's happening over at Hack Financial. What's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com. Lots of information on our weather algorithm, capital flows algorithm, our agronomy uh, signals that we use to make our forecast to see if that kind of information would be of value to your listeners. Right on. Sean, appreciate you being on the podcast, man. Thanks, Casey. Always a, always a blast.
Right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. You can also hit me up on uh, LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast and see the video version of this on the ever so cleverly named Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. And for all of you, that's on YouTube, just to make sure everyone's clear on that. You get anything Moving Iron related, go to movingironllc.com. And you can see everything there, anything and everything about Moving Iron. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Sean Haggett. It's Moving Smart, folks. Out. Moving Iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving Iron time and time again. Find us here. Move.